Okay, so we're back looking at this object that I filmed a uh, couple weeks ago. It's very tiny in the frame, and you can see it just barely. Um, and because of that, I've discovered some things. And um, right here, I'm going to show you real quick uh, a basic representation of what I saw with my naked eye. Uh, just a series of flashing that was kind of random. And that's what I tried to capture. And so... Basically, what I discovered is that because of this thing called hyperfocal distance, uh, the object has to be at least a mile away. And um, that still makes the size of the object, uh, if it's at a mile away, fairly small. It could even be only one and a half feet long. And so here I'm going to show that by uh, showing uh, a reference of size. If it is uh, about a mile away or 5,200 feet away, the object would be one and a half feet long, uh, the tether would be three and three quarters of a foot long, and the entire width of the frame would be roughly 225 feet. Now, this is significant because the smallest object I could imagine it being would be an object about that size. Unless it's like a miniature UFO, um, then, you know, obviously it, it, it you know, could be smaller. Um, but as far as like what people have suggested that it is, that's on the small side of mylar balloons that they suggest that it could be. And that's significant because the hyperfocal distance is actually at uh, just beyond a mile. Um, you know, it's a few hundred feet beyond the mile. And uh, what that means is that the object could be that far or it could be as far away as the moon or, you know, 30,000 feet or 300 miles. And here I've shown an example of the scale of the object, the size of the object, if it is uh, actually at 300 miles away from where I was filming. And that would put the object at 450 feet long, approximately, and the tether would be 1,100 feet long, approximately, and the width of the frame would be 68,500 feet. Um, now, this, I think, is a real possibility, and I, I wanted to show... Uh, just the numbers here on the size of the object and the size of the tether, um, just to uh, give an idea of the possibility uh, that this object could be coasting along. And, and um, it's big, but it's not exactly the most noticeable thing when it's that far away. So it's kind of small. And, you know, in reality, all I saw was just a blinking light. So I can't uh, disregard that it, it could be this far away. And, um, you know, it seems like a real possibility in my mind when trying to figure out what this thing is. Um, especially when I've I've been looking at tons of videos, like just of everything I can find online. And the ones that are the most fascinating to me are the, the ones that show an object um, from the International Space Station feed. Because uh, it's so similar to what I filmed from the ground, some of the objects are cigar shaped and I've seen uh, some that even look like they have a tether and some that uh, uh, have the cigar shape and they have two ends that light up and even flash in a kind of sequence uh, that's, that's random like what I captured from the ground. And it's just, it's just fascinating there, that there actually is that link and that's something that I imagined in my head. Uh, after seeing the object and just trying to figure out the distance of it. And here I'm showing the um, the scale if it's uh, 30,000 feet away, uh, which were my initial thoughts when I, when I saw it with my naked eye. And that would make the object roughly about 9 feet long, and the uh, tether would be about uh, 22 feet long, with the width of the uh, frame itself being about uh, 930 feet uh, wide. And um, I feel like this is significant because it just uh, it kind of shows uh, the idea of uh, the scale of my head um, when I was filming it, um, you know, at the at least the distance. And um, you know, when I got back in and I initially saw it, I was seeing it not like say a few hundred feet away. Um, in my head, it was like thirty thousand feet away, and that was like at least ten feet. So here, doing the math, it looks about nine feet. Uh, which is which is very interesting to me. And here I'm just showing uh, some stuff that I captured in the last couple of weeks. This is a uh, chemtrail that uh, 
just started to get a little bit uh, weird in the sky. Like it started to um, uh, just look more ribbon-like and, and uh, swirl around a little bit and eventually it broke up into pieces. And I found this fascinating because I just, I really haven't seen anything like that. Maybe I just haven't been paying attention. Um, but uh, just the, the way that it looks like it's falling um, and, uh, and swirling around and on itself and on the uh, cut up pieces, especially this part right here, um, at the very least, is just a fascinating uh, shot of uh, what a chemtrail can do. And um, if you look at it, it just, it, just look, it just looks so weird. It's like, what? What is going on? And I believe that's a coyote in the background. So um, <laughs> forgive me if I don't stay outside uh, at night very long uh, to look for anything weird in the sky <laughs> at night uh, because there are coyotes in the woods. And here is a, uh, this is an airplane. This is a uh, cargo plane, actually. I believe it's a C-17 um, Globemaster. And, um, you know, this is me testing out the, the manual focus. And, and I found that uh, once I get the guidelines uh, set up on the GH-5 and, and it's fly-by-wires, it's a little difficult, but it is very useful for, um, for capturing things that are more than a mile away um, because it'll keep the focus uh, on the object very well. And I follow this plane all the way through some trees and in it, um, it kept the focus on the object. It was pretty neat. Manual focus is very powerful. Um, unfortunately, uh, when, I'm, when I was going out before, I just my focus was on birds. And the only time I used manual focus was if a, uh, a bird was hidden in a bush. And, you know, honestly, bird, birds in a bush, uh, they move around a lot. So uh, doing the manual focus there, it, it's a little tricky. Um, but it still can be useful. But I just I'd never really uh, had it set up properly. I just want to uh, finish up with some actual birds and um, you know this is a northern mockingbird I was kind of I was below a tree uh, just kind of crouched down and it flew up and I happened to be very close to it and it's always exciting uh, when that happens and you're just right there to be able to capture uh, the moment and these birds are very common where I am um, but it, I love capturing them and this one is a Carolina wren, and I believe this is a male because it's doing that little call right there. And um, you know, if you'll notice, uh, both these shots are slowed down a little bit. Uh, they're about half speed, and uh, it's really nice to be able to do that so that you can just enjoy the movement, and uh, it just looks much more fluid. Whereas birds are just so quick, they're very fast, and and I find that it's. It's a little bit easier to see what's going on when you slow it down a little bit. So I just want to thank everybody for uh, watching this video and, and uh, listening to me uh, just blab on about uh, this object and, and what I think is going on with it. Um, you know, I find it very fascinating, um, you know, and I love reading the comments. I love hearing all the different theories, uh, even the ones that just dismiss it. Um, I, you know, I love hearing it because I want to know what it is. And uh, anyways, thank you again for watching, and, and if you like it, please hit the subscribe button, and, um, you know, keep searching.